Okay. Hello, everyone. Let me just Hello. turn on the screen share. Okay. All right. So, hey, everyone. I'm, um, oh, I'm getting a echo on Christian mute. I muted. Okay. Yeah, your phone wasn't or something. I don't know. I was getting no, a call on the phone. Okay. All right. Weird. Um, maybe it was a, the tech guy. I don't know. Sorry. Let's start again. Um, hey, everyone. I'm Stefan Graeber. We've got Christian Brauner. We both work at Canonical on the LexD team and on related container projects like Lexi, LexiFS, and um, kernel features related to those. Today, we're going to be talking about how to make your own containers um, from base Linux primitives. So first things first, um, what are our containers? Um, for some, they're a big chunk of metal, um, not that kind of containers we're talking about today. The um, containers are effectively isolated systems. Um, they're pretty similar to virtual machines, but different in a way that they share the kernel with the host. There is no virtualized firmware, no virtualized hardware. Um, you share, it's a group of special processes uh, sharing the, the host kernel. Um, on Linux, containers are purely a user space concept. Um, it's effectively a lie that we have um, that containers are a thing. It's user space deciding to use a number of kernel features together, and the result is called a container. That also means that what the container is really depends on whose software you're using, and that can vary quite quite widely, as we'll, we'll go into more details. Um, there is effectively yeah, no such thing as a container, no single way of detecting it either. So you, know, you might want some of your monitoring tools to be able to track your containers. You can probably do that on like a per container runtime basis, but there is no such no real way of knowing like, oh, this process is running on a container named something. Um, because again, depending on how you use those different bits, things can really change quite a bit. Some of the main components are used to create those containers. So you kind of need, um, like many containers start with file system isolation. Um, that's using true root or pivot root to give your process a different file system, um, which can be a different distro, a different version of your distro, or just a very restricted subpath of your file system. On top of those, you can use namespaces um, to further isolate a number of kernel objects effectively. Um, those namespaces are, in, I think those are in the order that were introduced. Um, UTS namespace first, which was like kind of just a demo namespace to some extent, it's effectively just holding your host name. Uh, so it lets you have a different host name, but that's it. Um, then the mount namespace, which is you have a different mount table, followed by the PID namespace, which gets you a different view of the process hierarchy, followed by the IPC namespace, which lets you uh, isolate your inter-process communication, things like shared memory uh, on a per namespace basis. Then the network namespace, which gets you your own set of network devices and loopback followed by the user namespace, which gives you a completely different view of uh, your system's user UID and GIDs. And um, well, it used to be the most recent, but actually is not. Um, then we had the C group namespace that was introduced uh, to allow having a different view of the C group hierarchy. And our most recent addition is the time namespace, which lets you have an offset based uh, time uh, tracking compared to the, to the base system. So you can have a I container that's offset that by, say, 30 seconds. Yeah. Yeah, that one's got, got introduced very recently and when they added, it, added support for it in LXC last week. Um, then you've got a number of security measures you can apply on top of that. It's probably worth mentioning that the user namespace is by itself a pretty big security measure um, and that a lot of those effectively act as safety nets when a user namespace is in use. Um, but those are the Linux security modules. So think AppArmor, say Linux, Smack, that can let you apply policies on what files and what objects you might be able to access from within a container. SecComp, which lets you filter system calls uh, and block 
old legacy system calls or newer system calls that you don't really trust yet. We also have um, capabilities that let you drop a number of, of kernel capabilities, well, like you know some specific part of the Linux kernel access. Resource controls, uh, that's done mostly through C groups on Linux. And that lets you, you know, prevent some number of attacks, especially denial of service type things. Um, we'll be going into each of those in much more details and show you how to actually use them all uh, together to, to create a, your own containers effectively in this presentation. Looking at, uh, we've got a no notes list of caveats. I think I mentioned some of those already. Uh, user namespaces are also a security feature. I mentioned that. Um, and oh yeah, the device is C group, which is technically a C group, but not really resource control so much as access control in that case. Devices C group lets you restrict what devices a container can access. So what device nodes in such dev effectively. All right. First, a word of warning. Um, <laughs> we will be showing you how to use all of those different features. Uh, at the end of this talk, you might be under the impression that you know, you're know you ready to write your own container runtime. We'd strongly recommend that you don't. Um, there are a lot of corner cases and, and you know, specific issues that apply that we know of, that we've discovered over the years, and that we know how to deal with. In general, if you can use an existing container runtime, use existing libraries, do not try this. Do not try to reinvent the wheel um, because you're going to run into problems. Um, some simple things, you know, um, you can, the order in which you use some namespaces, the order in which you apply some of those limits matters, even though it doesn't seem like it should. Um, and if you do it in the wrong order, you end up potentially having devastating security issues. Um, so yeah, something to keep in mind. Don't reinvent the wheel. Try to use existing libraries. Also, if you are in any way tempted to use privileged containers, don't. Those are a terrible idea. Um, we'll go into some more details about the user namespace and some of that later on to kind of explain what the difference is there. But effectively, you know, if yeah, just don't use privileged containers. All right. Um, so I'll hand it over to Christian to go through um, the uh, description of the, different, of the different features. And for each of them, I'm going to give a small demo afterwards uh, to show you how they actually work. Yep. So um, Stefan uh, mentioned like a lot of the components, or most of the components that uh, containers are actually most uh, uh, built from. Um, and as he said, it's one of the things uh, one of the problems is that everybody has their own opinion about oh, what a container is and uh, and what it isn't, and people usually have strong opinions about it. But I guess one of the things that most people agree upon is agree on is that it's at least it has to do with some sort of uh, some form of isolation from uh, the rest of the system. Otherwise, I mean, you technically you could, but you can't just create a new process and call it a container. I mean, it's not the, the point of the whole exercise, right? Uh, then writing a container runtime would be trivial as well. Um, one of the aspects is obviously file system isolation. Th this is, you know, usually shared between uh, between all users, so all users have the same view on the file system. Well, you start out in a different home directory, but still, like you can access uh, most directories and so on. Um, uh, and obviously, uh, this is something that people have been thinking about even before containers. On Linux, like how can you isolate your file system, your file system view, uh, and one of the, I guess most people call it the predecessor of any container or container runtime is uh, the crude syscall, it's actually, um, which gives you your own view on the file system, uh, on the file system hierarchy. Um, but it's easy to use. That's one of the advantages. Uh, but it's also terribly insecure, as Stefan will, will show you. It's pretty trivial to break out of a crude. So it's really just something that, yeah, that you want to use for fun, but not, um, to write a container runtime. So because of all these shortcomings, um, people implemented or the kernel provides um, another system call, uh, which is the pivot root syscall, which gets around, 
uh, some of the security issues that CRUD has. It's a secure version uh, uh, of CRUD, essentially. Um, it's harder to use. Often involves a mount namespace. It doesn't have to, but often does. Um, it has a couple of restrictions. You can't use it on RAM disks, uh, which means if you want to run a container on a RAM disk, then you can't use the pivot root system call, which is not that great. Um, especially if you want to run system containers, so containers that boot a hole in a system. Um, and it also moves a bunch of, uh, you have to move a bunch of mounts around in some instances. Um, and you can use pivot root if you're on a shared mount point. So if you want to have a, so if you want to have, uh, if you want to have your containers root file system, BMS shared that won't work with pivot root, which is a shame because it means mount propagation is not really something that you can use. Uh, uh, use you can use it with containers, obviously, but you can't use it for your root file system, which is a shame, um, to be honest. Um, yeah, and usually pivot root should be done in a mount namespace. So both of them get you a private view on the file system hierarchy. That's what I said. So you can uh, suddenly a different directory becomes your slash. Uh, and uh, so you protect your own root file system. Um, and Stefan will now go on to show you how you can escape a CRUD, hopefully, and how Pivot Root is, uh, protects you from that. Yep. Okay, so um, as you can see, I'm running this as a normal user on my laptop. I'm going to be using the unshare command to create a new user namespace, a new mount namespace, a new PID namespace, remap my current user to root, and fork as a process for root measure. At which point I'm root-ish. I mean, I'm root in that namespace, but not real system root. Um, I've got in that directory, I do have a directory structure head called Alpine Edge that shows a normal Linux structure. I can uh, show root to it. Oops. Uh, bin message because Alpine does not have bash. There we go. And we see that yeah, I'm on slash now in that container. Okay, that's fine. Um, let's see now in my tiny container, I mount proc. Um, well, then you'll see there's a tiny problem because proc will show you oops, um, all the processes from the host in there, um, including bid one which now lets me do this, at which point I am no longer in that container anymore. I'm on my actual system. And I just Yay bypass magic to see it through entirely. Yeah. So that's a bit of a problem with, with um, Truroot. And that's why instead what you could do is same thing. So create the same namespace. Uh, we need to create a mount entry for that directory. So we just mind mount it on top of itself. Then we go into it, and then we use pivot root to replace slash with that. So that's the replacement for true root. Okay, that's done. At which point I can say exec bsh, And now I'm back to being in a container. Same view as before. Now let's do the same thing. Let's mount proc and try to escape with proc one root. Doesn't work, there's no bin bash. That's because proc one now points back to us. So if I do SH, I'm back where I started. Like I can't escape through that particular issue anymore. Um, so that's really the difference between true root and, and pivot root. Uh, pivot root is also actively used uh, by Linux distributions during boot um, to switch from an in, from an in intran disk over to the final um, physical hard disk that you're booting. Uh, so that's that's its other use really outside of containers. But yeah, pivot root effectively lets you replace a lot more of the references um, by the the target uh, material hierarchy instead of uh, instead of the old one. Okay, let's switch back to the slides and switch back to the next topic. Name spaces. Ah, yes. Sorry, by the way, there, there is sometimes there is a bit of lag. So if I'm reacting a little slower, it's not, it's uh, because of being in Europe, I guess. Um, 
Yeah, namespaces. I mean, this is, I, I guess, uh, this is what most people think of when they think uh, containers on Linux. Um, and to some extent, uh, namespaces, someone once put it, namespaces are a way, well, basically on Linux, we didn't think about containers. So we invented namespaces uh, to get around some of the inflexibilities of the kernel. Um, I like that idea. So namespaces give you a lot of flexibility in doing a lot of different things, not just implement containers. They are obviously most closely associated with containers, but there are a bunch of them that have uses outside of container, in independent of containers. So yeah, uh, multiple namespaces. We have uh, seven, and uh, since the last kernel release, or since two kernel releases ago, we have eight namespaces. Um, so mount, UTS, user, net, IPC, C group, PIT, and uh, finally, we also have a, a time namespace. Um, and the oldest one, as far as I remember right now, is the mount namespace. And actually, this, this I think it, it was invented independent of containers. I think it was just an idea. Um, uh, like one of the first motivations was to give each user their own mount hierarchy when they log into the system. There is even an old uh, article somewhere from IBM out there that mentions this. So mount namespaces are again concern, are concerned with the mount hierarchy. Um, and uh, it, it, the easiest uh, example is that you want to get your own private mount table, right? So uh, if you share if you share a mount namespace and you U mount something, then you U mount, you unmount it for every user. So you plug in a USB stick, somebody mounts it, but then some other user also uh, unmounts that USB stick and then it's gone. Um, so the idea is obviously, how, what, if, what if we implement a mechanism that makes it possible to give you your own private mount table such that U mounts in one namespace don't really affect the U mount, uh, the mounts in another namespace. So I could mount the same USB stick in one mount namespace and in another one. And if I unmounted it in one, in one of them, I don't automatically unmount it uh, in the other one. Um, if only it were that easy. That's the main thing uh, people think about when they think mount namespaces, but mount namespaces also come with a tiny feature that is called mount propagation. And mount propagation lets you set up uh, dependent mounts, for example. So uh, you mount, mount events only propagate into a dependent mount namespace, but, it, uh, uh, but if you unmount something in the dependent mount namespace, it won't show up in, uh, in the parent or dominant mount namespace. And then you have something called shared mount names or shared propagation, which means if you unmount in one mount namespace and then and it also propagates into any other mount namespace. Uh, if they if they have shared mount propagation set, um, so it's a bit complicated. And actually, we use some of this some of the mount uh, mount propagation trickery to implement features such as hot plugging mounts into containers and so on. Um, so it makes it a lot more uh, complicated uh, than probably they need to be by now, especially now that we have containers. Uh, they're pretty important, especially when you think about uh, using pivot root. Um, we have UTS namespaces. Stefan mentioned this. This is rather unexciting insofar as uh, you can change your host name, um, which is uh, which is important for containers. Obviously, uh, you have the network namespace, which is concerned with isolating the network stack. It's your set of private network devices, private IP tables, private routing tables, and so on. Uh, and that you, that you can obviously see that this has a use case completely independent um, of uh, containers. Um, uh, network uh, network namespaces, uh, I, I guess, are the prime example of having usage outside of containers. IPC namespace, uh, usually for most people, also pretty unexciting, just concerned with isolating um, POSIX, Sys5, Linux, uh, IPC protocols, and so on. And the C group namespace, this is really, I guess, a namespace that is that only really exists for containers because um, it's concerned with basically showing you similar to how mount similar to how crude gives you a, a private view on uh, your file system root, 
uh, C group gives you a, a different view on your C group route. So instead of being located, so if you, for example, are located in Sisyphus C group, my C group, um, you don't see the whole Sisyphus, my, Sisyphus C group, my C group path, you would only see slash uh, if you're in a container. So you have the impression that my C group is actually your C group route. Uh, so th this is uh, this is really just something that exists for containers, I think. Pit name spaces are important insofar as they isolate your uh, process ID identifiers, meaning uh, in a new pit name space, uh, you can have pit one, even though on seen from the host pit name space, it's PID 12, for example. Um, uh, and pit name spaces, pit name spaces in, in themselves are pretty interesting. I could talk about them for a long time, but I won't. Otherwise, Stefan will uh, get annoyed. Uh, and the last one is uh, the time name space, which is, I guess, most important for container migration. So when you migrate from one physical host to another physical host, migrate a container from one physical host to another physical host, uh, then you can easily end up in a scenario where monotonic time seems to go back backwards, uh, which can be an issue, <laughs> a bit of it, especially when you migrate containers. So you can specify an offset um, to make sure that when you restore a container on the host, monotonic time uh, or boot time uh, actually increases. Uh, so uh, this, uh, this namespace has just been implemented and we've added support for it uh, recently. And the namespace API is a bit complicated, I would say. Uh, so Stefan mentioned problems that the way, uh, the order in which you create namespaces sometimes matters. This, I guess the remaining example is the network namespace. If you um, create a user namespace and a network namespace at the same time, I think you can get either IP tables or uh, NF tables, routing table ownership wrong. So you need to create a user namespace first and then write an ID mapping and then unshare your network namespace to get the ownership right. Um, I haven't... Oh, I thought the, uh, the permissions in slash sys also get wonky if, yeah, you, could... if you do user before mm -hmm. network or the other one. Well, the other That's one. Yeah, that's actually something that would be fixed by a uh, by a patch I'm thinking of, but I digress. Um, and namespace, uh, so names the way the order in which you create namespaces can be can be quite important. Um, and you can create them with a clone syscall, which is usually uh, how uh, how container runtimes do it. We have the uh, then there's the unshare syscall, which unshares your namespace, so also creates a new, new namespace if you want to. Uh, Think about it like that. Um, and you can change your namespace. You can attach to the namespace of another process as well. There is an API for this as well. It's called the set an S set namespace um, syscall. Um, and uh, I guess the most important uh, namespace that I haven't uh, mentioned so far is the user namespace, uh, which is concerned with isolating the, uh, the privilege concept on, on Linux. So uh, isolating IDs, um, giving a container the impression that it is it actually runs as UID zero as seen from its own user namespace. But if you look at it from the outside and you see it runs as a completely unprivileged ID, uh, 100,000 or something, it also uh, encapsulates capabilities, meaning if you have capsys admin in a non-initial user namespace, then it hasn't, uh, it, it doesn't mean you have it in the initial namespace. Uh, so capabilities are per namespace as well. And one last thing I should mention is um, that each namespace that's not the user namespace has an owning user namespace. Well, technically, I guess a user namespace also always has a, an owning user namespace. But so if you create a new network namespace, um, uh, it will be owned by the initial user namespace. If you create a user namespace and then create a network namespace from within that user namespace, that network namespace will be owned by uh, the user namespace that you created before. Um, and this way, the permission checking is always uh, right. And also you see that there's another dependence between namespaces. So namespaces have only user namespaces, but 
Uh, I could go on, but Stefan will now give you a, a nice example of how namespaces can be used. Yep. Okay. So let's switch back to this. There we go. All right. So namespaces. Um, on the easiest way to show namespaces on Linux is again with the uncheck commands that I used earlier. Um, it's got arguments to control creation of man namespace, UTS namespace, uh, IPC namespace, network namespace, bin namespace, user namespace, and C group namespace. Uh, it doesn't currently have time namespace, but it's probably just because I'm using an old version of it. I'm sure someone sent a patch for that one already. Let's look, let's start by looking at the namespaces for our current process. So you can see that in proc, and that shows you a Simulink looking thing, which is actually a magic link for every one of the namespaces that your process is in. Because I didn't unshare anything yet at this point, those should mostly match up uh, the host namespace for all of those, the initial namespace for all of those. So now if I do, I'm just gonna, whoops, uh, start the right level. So I'm just gonna unshare a user namespace, remap myself for this process. Now, if I look there, you're going to see, well, I mean, you need to look pretty closely, but you, you can see that the numbers for all of the different entries are the same, except for the user namespace, which has changed because we just unshared it. Now, let's do something a bit more useful and unshare a map namespace from within that. Um, we could once again go and look at which point we would change from mount was 1840, and now we're at 2725. Okay, uh, let's do another one. Let's do it in a document space now. Okay. So the network goes from 2008 over to 2731. That also means that now we've got an empty network namespace. So if I look at all the devices in there, we only get a loopback device, which every network namespace gets. Okay. And lastly, let's, well, not lastly, but almost lastly, let's do a new PID namespace. So now we've done both a mount namespace and a PID namespace. That means we can do a new amount of proc. There we go. And if we look at the list of process, now we only have two. We've got PID1, which is the shell that I used to create this uh, PID namespace. And we've got PID19, which is the PS command that I just ran. If I try to change my name at this point, so change the, name, the host name from Castiana over to Blanc, it's going to tell us you can't. That's because there's another namespace we didn't share yet. That's that UTS namespace. So let's do that and share UTS. Hey, now we can change host name. And if we spawn a new shell, we've got the new host name in place. So that's a bit of an overview of what unshell lets you do. Uh, it really lets you unshare one namespace at a time or multiple namespaces at a time and build the, the namespace view that you want. Um, it also does convenient things like that uh, UID remapping from your normal UID over to root. Uh, one thing I can quickly show for the user namespace too here, uh, if I go back to just creating user namespace. So I show up as root, right? UID zero, GID zero. Now, if I create a random file, say blah, we see on the file system that blah is owned by root. Now, if we get out of that container and we look at the ownership, we're going to see that blah is owned by me. Um, that's because that's what the user namespace does. Uh, and out of the box, the, you're allowed to always map your own user ID and group ID to UID0 and GID0 inside a user namespace, which is exactly what Unshare does. So when you see root, you're really not root. It just looks like you are, but you're actually still your own user outside of the container. Yeah, so this is the, uh, the ID mapping concept that um, uh, that the user namespace encompasses, which is uh, I'm always looking for words. I mean, I'm, I've am i worked on this uh, in the kernel and in uh, user space, uh, and I still find it hard to succinct, succinctly explain how the user namespace uh, works 
Right, and that's next one is gonna be stack comp. Right, so um, I'm always torn here if this is, I, it's a core feature. It's kind of related to LSMs, so to Linux security modules, which we will uh, which we will mention in a little bit. But to some extent, it's also it's not bec because LSMs are always treated as being kind of an optional add-on to container security, while SecComp is kind of considered at the core of uh, container security, I guess. And I think that's due to the to the fact that it's been around in linux for such a long time and it's really concerned with uh with syscalls and uh, in a very at a very low level at the entry point uh of the syscall uh, syscall path in the kernel i guess so um second secure computing obviously um and it allows you to restrict syscalls i guess that's the easiest explanation um so if obviously there is for unprivileged containers is not so much a problem necessarily, but for privileged containers, it definitely is. So there are a bunch of syscalls that if you were to just allow them could allow you to escalate privileges to es potentially escape the container or in general, just do things uh, that you shouldn't be allowed to do. Uh, um, and I guess uh, Stefan's favorite example always has been open by handle at, uh, which is a way, uh, I, I guess it even works with, un does it work with unprivileged containers? I'm not sure right now. Mm, no, it doesn't. Uh, it's it's blocked uh, by default. Yeah, by but, I, I think you get EPUM or something, It needs you need some extra privileges there. Yeah, but you can ba you can basically even if you have used pivot root, you, you can use it to escape to you can use it to escape to host root, uh, which is obviously pretty yeah. bad. So this is a syscall you definitely yeah. you definitely want to block. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's a it's a very nifty syscall uh, that caused a bunch of uh, a bunch of issues for Docker and others a few years back. Effectively, what it would let you do is you would open, I think, a file descriptor to some directory, and then it would let you get a file descriptor for something relative to that directory. So you would effectively open, say, slash in your container, and then say, I would like dot dot slash from there. Yeah, and it yeah. would quite happily traverse onto the host and escape the pivot route entirely. Um, so that was a bit of a problem. Mm -hmm. um, it's blocked by all container runtimes for years now, but that's the kind of example of issues with previous containers and old syscalls that people don't really remember. It's a syscall that hasn't received much love for sure over uh, over the years. Um, so yeah, that, so definitely a syscall you want to restrict, uh, restrict especially for, um, for privileged containers. Um, but also, if you, it's, you know, a principle of uh, uh, least security, least security, mm -hmm. the principle of least security. Um, no, I mean, if you want to, if you run an application, it's usually, uh, it's usually a good idea to only give it access uh, to what it absolutely needs. This becomes obviously more of an issue when you think about browsers uh, doing decoding and video encoding and so on, running kinds of plugins that you really don't trust. Um, so you want to restrict the syscall interface and for example, just allow them to open specific files uh, or uh, yeah, call specific syscalls. Um, and SecComp is, is the way to do this. So in the, in the easiest implementations, you just, uh, you just uh, say, here's a set of syscalls you're allowed to use. Uh, so this would be the allow list uh, approach or you have a deny list where you um, where you block all syscalls, uh, where you block all syscalls uh, that you think shouldn't be allowed, but you allow uh, all others. Uh, obviously, the allow approach is uh, is the smarter approach because if you add a new uh, syscall to the kernel that you deem unsafe, um, you're still in the clear. Um, and, 
you can instruct Seccom to, for example, say if it if it blocks a, a given syscall, you report back a specific error code to user space. Like you you can tell Seccom, I want a specific error code returned to user space. Uh, and the usual convention uh, that we follow with our container runtimes, at least, uh, is that we return back EPERM because most uh, most programs will know how to gracefully move on when they receive EPERM. Um, yeah. Yeah, that or using uh, Enosis, which is the other way of getting a, a nice fallback on newer syscalls, effectively pretending yeah. that the kernel does not support the syscall, yeah. which then causes the uh, coding program to go through a compatibility code path. But you can also use, uh, you can also get more fancy than that. Um, you can write, so Secomp uh, makes use of a dialect of BPF. Uh, most people nowadays think, when they think of BPF, they think about eBPF, extended uh, BPF. But, um, and what Secomp is, uh, uses is a predecessor, essentially CBPF or classic BPF, which is a retrofitted term actually, it used to be called just BPF. Um, and you can write second filters in CBPF, uh, which has some limitations, um, but it, it's still pretty expressive. It means you can define more complex syscall filters. And for example, filter based on arguments passed to a system call. But uh, because of the way CBPF works, uh, there are some limitations. One limitation, for example, is that you um, all pointers are essentially opaque to SECOM. So if you want to filter the mount syscall, if you wanted to filter the open syscall and you were to want, yeah, you were to filter on the, um, on the path pass to open, which is not a great idea. Um, uh, you can't do this because for SECOM can't you reference pointers. It can't chase pointers. So any structure that is passed by pointer and so on for SECOM is, uh, is, opaque to it. But you can filter on, on uh, any register-based arguments. So if you have a flag argument, then you can filter on opens flag argument, also not that useful, but uh, or on mount flag argument. Um, for a bunch of syscalls, this is this is uh, pretty helpful. So you could, for example, restrict the uh, unshare syscall to only allow you to unshare the user namespace, but not any of uh, the other namespaces. So it helps you. Uh, it's actually uh, quite useful. Um, and SECOMP recently has been uh, extended. Uh, this is work uh, we've been involved in as well. Um, you can intercept syscalls. Well, you could always do this, but you can also now outsource uh, the decision whether or not a syscall is supposed to be skipped uh, or continued uh, to another user space process. Um, so you can use SECOMP to supervise and emulate uh, syscalls. Uh, the way this is done is that a task can get a file descriptor for its own second filter. And then that file descriptor can be handed off to, for example, the container runtime. This file descriptor itself is pollable, uh, meaning uh, you can get uh, events for uh, for syscalls that you have uh, regis registered in your second filter. And then uh, when you receive an, a syscall event of interest, the file descriptor becomes readable, and then you can read the second information from the file descriptor, which involves the syscall number, the architecture, um, the syscall arguments, and then you can go on and read. E even if you wanted to, you can now in user space chase uh, chase pointers, what second can do. And there is ways to do this safely, but uh, one needs to be careful. Uh, um, uh, I can go into detail, but uh, probably that means we would be running out of time. Um, yes. And uh, yeah, so we're using it to emulate syscalls, meaning we get a notification. You get a notification for a syscall, for example, the make not syscall. And uh, then you can inspect the syscall arguments and you can realize, oh, right, the container is just trying to create a dev console, which is, pretty, uh, which is a pretty boring uh, device node. Um, and which we bind mount into the container anyway. So why not emulate the syscall in user space for the container, create the device node in the containers, um, in the containers mount namespace uh, and call it done. So this is what we can do with, um, when the sun's coming up, I'm being Linus. And uh, 
this is yes this is what you can do with uh, this is what you can do with uh, uh, with the second uh, notifier as it is uh, as it's called um, but that's a pretty extended uh, a pretty advanced usage I would say for uh, for SecCom, usually you just really use it as an additional or core security uh, security mechanism, um, uh, whereby you restrict the container to only uh, uh, only use a certain set or subset of syscalls. Uh, for system containers, this is somewhat um, we could do it, but usually for system containers, and since we're most since we are mainly concerned with running. Um, with running unprivileged containers in the first place, we can, for the most part, rely on the kernel blocking uh, blocking all dangerous syscalls anyway. Um, so having a allow list approach for system containers is usually not a good idea because you're booting a full uh, full init system. But if you're running uh, a tiny application, just one single process in your container that doesn't need to do a lot. Um, then you can use a you can use a allow list and only allow a very small um, set of syscalls. But Stefan can uh, give you a, a fun little demo of returning a weird little error code code uh, via Secom. Right. So one. Let's just get ourselves another namespace. Uh, keep doing that. This time we're going to be allowing the we're going to get a month namespace as well. There we go. And let's look. So there's a second but C file here. Um, let's look at what that does. So that's directly. Uh, so not, we're not even using lib second really. Uh, just writing a bit of BPF, uh, which effectively says that if you're trying to call uh, the mount syscall, we're gonna return eno ano as the error, and for everything else, we can you get to go through. Uh, and the command, effectively, like when you run that binary, what it will do is it will spawn a uh, bash terminal as a subprocess with that profile applied. But a lot of subprocess will re exec itself, really. So if we run this, we get back. Um, well, actually, let's do a let's first do a normal mount. So we'll just try to mount tempfs on slash, slash mount. Fine. No problem there. Let's unmount it. Now let's get ourselves that. Restricted terminal. Everything is working as normal there, except for now if I try to do this, I think no anode, which is you know anode um, response, and that's kind of the most basic example of uh, just blocking a syscall using using seccomp. Um, for more complex use cases, you definitely want to use something like libseccomp to do a lot of the abstraction for you. One thing mm. to keep in mind is that syscall numbers differ between architectures and can differ even within the same architecture depending on exactly what mode you're in. So yeah. you want to be kind of careful with that. You don't want to make too many assumptions. Uh, for example, uh, in this case, I could probably use the 32-bit version of the mount syscall and still bypass that. Um, and yeah. There are a lot of kind of cases around syscalls that you need to keep in mind. <laughs> That's why there are good libraries around that, and you should be using those. Um, some of those libraries also let you optimize your BPF code for maximum performance. Because if you want to allow, say, 200 syscalls, you don't really want to go and have like one if statement after the other that can quickly make things slow. So there's some, some amount of uh, optimization that exists around that. Even uh... Even when you're when you have sub well sub architectures, but uh, think about um, running uh, 30 uh, 32 bit uh, user space on a 64 bit kernel, um, and I think we had cases where it was a 64 uh, 64 bit kernel on a 32 bit user space, then a container with a uh, uh, 64 bit user space and then another container with a 32 bit user space and then you're sort of writing a correct second filter for this and making sure that the um, that all of the uh, even lip second sometimes gets confused uh, in these scenarios or used to get confused in these kind of scenarios so this is really not uh, uh, not a trivial um, exercise um, New uh, kernels will make sure, thanks to work by Ant 
uh, Backman will make sure that the same system call number is used for most architectures. The only exceptions are alpha, but everyone has a deck alpha at home, I assume. Um, and uh, IA64, and I think the MIPS architectures as well. Uh, so things that are widely in use. Although I have an IA64 server right here next to me. So, um, but yeah, it's kind of, yeah, it's, it's not a, as easy. There's a lot of MIPS equipment out there. <laughs> yeah. There is. Um, and like, so, think of all of, all of your Wi Fi routers and stuff. Most of those are, are still MIPS. Some of the newer yeah. stuff is on, but MIPS is still pretty common. So you need to be careful there. Like, people actively use yeah. uh, LXC containers on MIPS and have run into some of those issues in the past. I think MIPS is simply, if I remember this correctly, MIPS is prepending, is indicating the architecture type by prepending five, four, or three to the syscall number or something like this. And uh, uh, IA64 has like an offset of 1,200 or something. But yeah, so uh, generating a correct second filter is not, uh, can be a non-trivial um, exercise. Even actually, if you, uh, if you use the notifier example I said before and you read uh, syscall information, you read the raw syscall information um, from from the notifier um, and the kernel will give you a syscall number back and then you need to be sure to know what architecture you're actually on to know what syscall, what syscall you're getting notified about. Otherwise, you're going to be very confused when you think it's a make not syscall, but actually on this architecture, this number is mount. Um, that can actually happen. But yeah, it's so so far for a second. Okay, next up is capabilities. That should be a slightly faster topic, so long as we don't go too much into the math that's involved with some of that stuff. <laughs> yes, um, capabilities. Uh, so once upon a time, no. Um, uh, traditionally, when we think about uh, doing uh, performing operations that have um, an effect on the whole system or are, can be considered in some way critical. Shutting down the system, mounting, uh, mounting a device uh, and so on uh, are usually guarded by some sort of, uh, you need to have some sort of privilege on the system and the traditional concept for uh, for Linux, for Unix, I get POSIX, I guess, is uh, being root, being uh, uh, UID zero. Um, and that's obviously, that means it, it, that that's basically allowed to do, it's not true anymore, but uh, it's basically allowed to do, uh, if you're root, you're allowed to do anything you want with the system, which is non-ideal because you, you can, you, you remember, people are familiar with, uh, with Linux or with traditional Unix systems, we remember all of the uh, the issues we have with set ID bits. So uh, if you want to enable an unprivileged user to perform an operation that requires privilege, you need to have some sort of mechanism to implement this and the traditional, I guess, workaround, or some people nowadays probably call it hack, is uh, to set the set as ID, set UID bit uh, on a binary and have that binary be owned by root. And so if an unprivileged user calls that binary, it uh, can run with elevated privileges and perform a given, oper a given operation. Um, but obviously that means if you have any flaw within the binary, that means you can potentially use that binary to exploit, uh, yeah, to attack the system. and. That obviously has never happened ever in the whole history of Linux, but um, it's uh, that was a bit of an issue, and people obviously realized this, and people tried to come up with different uh, ideas on uh, how to solve this problem. And I guess people still have strong opinions about this one. Uh, and Linux has gone in a specific direction. You can like it or you cannot like it, but this direction is uh, uh, capabilities, um, which I which differ from the way you would think about capabilities if you just look at it uh, from a, a computer, from the computer science literature. It's uh, not really capabilities like you would um, you would do them. Um, but they are a way of splitting up the root privilege into separate uh, distinct 
I guess, privilege uh, set. So the closest you can come to, to being root if you, uh, if you have capability support is having Capsys admin on the system that allows you to mount file systems. And, uh, I have obviously have this all in my mind. I'm not totally looking at the man page right now. Um, Oh yeah, Capsys admin has a long. If looking at it, if you have uh, if you have a terminal in front of you and you type man capabilities, you can see there is a long list of what you can do when you have Capsys admin. You, it's basically the new root. It tends to be the one that button. we use whenever we don't have anything better to use. So. Yeah, it's... and every time and every time we don't know how to guard something within the kernel, we make it NS capable Capsys admin. Um, uh, but there are a bunch of finer grained capabilities. So we have Capsys uh, resource, which lets you override resource limits, Capsys time, which lets you set the system clock, system clock and so on. There's a long list. Um, Cap shown, uh, Cap set UID, Cap set GID, change ownership and so on. Um, so it, pro it definitely has some, uh, has some benefits. Uh, and um, capabilities have an interesting uh, have an interesting property since the uh, addition of user namespaces. So before I briefly mentioned that user namespaces uh, isolate UIDs and uh, GIDs such that root inside of the container isn't root outside of the container, and they also do the same thing with capabilities. Meaning, um, if you ask the question, "Do I have a cap capability?" What you're really asking, and or what the kernel understands, is, "Do I have this capability?" in the relevant user namespace. Um, and if you do, you can perform that operation. And if you don't, then you can't perform this operation. But the world is obviously not that simple. It's, it's not always, you're not always asking the kernel automatically the question, do I have the capability in that user namespace? Often uh, for some operations, like for example, calling make not, creating device nodes, um, what you're really asking the kernel uh, is, uh, what you're asking the kernel is, do I have this capability inside of this user namespace? What the kernel is actually looking for is that you have the capability in the initial user namespace. So some capabilities um, in some circumstances are not charged against the user namespace uh, you're currently in, but they use the initial user namespace because it affects the whole system. So capabilities are kind of have this weird state where you have to have the capability in the right, uh, in the right user namespace. Um, but in general, uh, it's capability in a given in a given user namespace, uh, and they come in different sets. So Stefan listed in here: effective capabilities, inherent capabilities, permitted capabilities, ambient capabilities, and bounding capabilities. And there is there is set theory on the capabilities man, man page. I'm not joking. So um, the interesting set for us right here is essentially the effective capability set. Uh, which is the capability set that uh, the capability set that the kernel is looking at when it when you ask the question M do I have this capability in the given uh, user namespace you can expand this to do I have the effective capability in that given user namespace so do I have it have this capability right now and ambient capabilities for example inherited capabilities you would think are the capabilities that you take with you when you exec a new process but actually that's not how that works it's also pretty complicated. So ambient capabilities were invented that you, so that you can preserve capabilities safely across uh, exec VE. And there are some restrictions also. So um, you see it's interesting. Uh, usually for privileged containers, you drop a bunch of capabilities and especially Capsys admin, because if you have Capsys admin, then game over anyway. Um, for unprivileged containers, as I said, capabilities are per um, user namespace. And so, uh, especially again for um, for system containers, you don't really need to drop uh, a lot of capabilities. It's usually, when you like want to lock down your process even um, or your container even more um, than just making it an unprivileged containers. And uh, last but not least, we have file capabilities. And I mentioned the set uh, UID bit that you can set on uh, certain binaries to get around, uh, to make it possible for unprivileged users to gain privilege, to perform privileged operations. Um, this was a, a you, get all, uh, you get all privilege or no privilege at all kind of operation. And file capabilities are a way to selectively choose specific uh, uh, delegate a specific type or subset of privileges, for example, the 
Ping nowadays has uh, cap raw, not capnet admin. Capnet raw. Think. Thank you. Capnet raw. Capnet raw. So uh, you can set a file capability on uh, a given binary, and then when you execute this binary, this capability gets raised, uh, and then you can perform a privileged operation. So it's a more fine-grained set UID. Don't quote me on this. Um, and uh, they're also namespaced, which is uh, which is nice. They weren't for a long time, but this is work uh, uh, which a colleague of my former colleague of mine has uh, has actually done. Um, so you can now set file capabilities uh, in uh, in a user namespace, which is obviously pretty great because before, if you unpacked or untarred um, a, a file system root file system. Um, the capabilities weren't preserved or couldn't also uh, couldn't be uh, could be set, and this is now actually possible. We, for example, make uh, quite a bit of uh, use of this in LexD um, uh, itself. And Stefan can now give you a demo of uh, how this works. Yep. Right. Okay, so capabilities. Let's just. Reset this once again. Uh, oh. So first, let's see what we have. Um, I'm running as a community and privileged user on my laptop, so I've got nothing. That's not surprising. Now I can ensure a user namespace, do a network namespace as well, remap root to my user, and fork as a process. And let's see what we have now. Okay, hey, I've got everything. Um, so CapSH used to be showing us the entire list and I just shortened this, but that means I've got everything. That means that I can say add a new network device in that network namespace I created. It works perfectly fine. The device is now there. Um, let's say we do CapSH and this time we want to drop cap net admin and spawn a new terminal using that. Now, let's go look at what capabilities we have. I've got everything minus CapNet Admin. And sure enough, if I now try to create another dummy device, I'm no longer allowed to do it. And obviously, it's not there. We only see the previous one. But that's what dropping capabilities lets you do. Like It lets you block some specific part of the um, kernel API. We could also have done it the other way around with just allowing the few capabilities I actually do need to get everything else done, but prevent that one part. But in this case, it shows how to how to handle capability dropping on Linux. And every user namespace, I think we didn't mention this, every user namespace starts out. So if you create a user namespace, you start out with a whole set uh, of capabilities. Um, so it's not that you Yep. Yep. Go on. Uh, yeah, you get everything, uh, which is a bit confusing some people because they, you know, they're assuming if I get caps this time, then I'm allowed to change the global system clock. Well, no, actually you're not because the global system clock is checking for caps this time against the initial user namespace, not against a, your current user namespace. So even though you've got the capability in your user namespace, it doesn't actually let you change system time. So some yeah. like a number of, of uh, software kind of does the wrong thing there and gets super confused. But yeah, user namespaces give you gives you the entire set of capabilities against that particular namespace. Yeah. All right. Next one is the Linux security modules. So this is what I uh, briefly um, uh, touched upon uh, touched on before. Um, Linux security modules are well. I guess maybe it's just me, but I've always seen them as sort of an optional thing for uh, containers. Not in the sense of uh, like you definitely should uh, you definitely should use them, but if you think about what is a container, then you wouldn't think something is not a container if it doesn't use Linux security modules. I think, um, and also there are different ones, right? So you have App Arma and you have SA Linux, which are the two big ones that people think about and at least as of now, it's still the case that you can either use App Armor or SL Linux, or distros usually use either App Armor or SL Linux, but uh, not both. And sort of, um, yeah, 
So uh, major major LSMs are SA Linux, App Armor, and SMEC. Um, uh, Linux security modules let you implement um, additional security by not just letting you do DAC, so discrete access control, but mandatory access control. It's obviously a big thing if you uh um in in security we're not going to go into detail here but linux um linux has not one uh one uh mandatory access control mechanism it had a bunch of them as linux app armor smack uh we now have a bpf based lsm i think even though it's not yet uh concerned with access control i guess um and uh one of the so, for example, we use on on Ubuntu we use App Armor. So we have an App Armor profile for uh, all of our containers, which we load by which we load by default, which uh, blocks a bunch of uh, blocks a bunch of operations which we deem unsafe. And for privileged operations for privileged uh, containers, it's uh, mu a much bigger deal uh, because. Um, Linux security modules uh, in these for privileged containers actually do the, I guess, the heavy lifting of uh, making the container uh, even just remotely secure. So if you're running a privileged container, but you're not even Linux, using a Linux security module with a decent profile, then you can just not run a container at all, I guess. Unless you have a specific use case, I mean. Um, uh, and for unprivileged containers, it's not it's an additional safety net, I would say. This is always how how we have used it. So every unprivileged container also has an app armor profile, or if, for example, if you're running on Fedora, has an um, additional SA Linux profile um, as an additional safety net. Uh, one of the things that we've been interested in uh, and that's work that's slowly going upstream uh, is to make it possible to stack LSMs. So similar to how, when you think about namespaces, right? Um, you uh, you start a container and you start another container in there. So you nest unprivileged containers. You have a user namespace inside of a user namespace. But there's also a use case for when you have um, an unprivileged container or a privileged con yeah, an unprivileged container that runs another unprivileged container. And you in the first one, you want to run App Armor, and in the second one, you want to run as a Linux or the other way around. Ideally, we would at one point in the future end up in a scenario where we have one container with um, running App Armor, another one running as a Linux, another one running App Armor, another one running as a Linux. So you can mix and match, mix and match the whole stack. I don't know how feasible that is, but at least we we can end up in a scenario where we can do one level of stacking, I hope, where you can have App Armor uh, on the host and SA Linux inside of a container. That would already help a lot because right now this is, as far as I understand, not something that you uh, can currently do. But this is work that takes its time. Um, there is some resistance or there has been some resistance by maintainers, but also, um, but also it's difficult to implement correctly because some LSMs used to have maybe still have expectations uh, on what level of the stack they are, like who gets the last say. Um, yeah, and uh, with App Armor, we at least have LSM namespaces, uh, so we can nest App Armor profiles. So each container can, uh, can get its own App Armor profile. That's what we do when we nest containers in, um, in Lexd, uh, at least. So yeah. Um, LSM's pretty big security mechanism core uh, feature need to have when using privileged containers and an, an additional safety net when dealing with unprivileged containers. But Stefan can give you a demo. Yep. Okay. So I'm running on Ubuntu, so the demo is going to be on Apama. I'm going to be showing first what the current LSM um, label is in my case, uh, which is unconfined. So that's what you normally get uh, outside of a container or outside of a application specific profile. Now I'm gonna spawn bash under the LXC container default profile, which is already defined on my system. I've done that, at which point we can see that this is applied. Uh, that particular restriction is not super useful right now, but it's to show that even an unprivileged process is allowed to switch to a profile that was already loaded 
on the system. Now uh, let's put an actual container. Okay. So now I've got that container running, I'm gonna grab its process ID, which is this thing. And from the outside, I can go look at that particular process and what its ID is. As you can see this one is rather long. Um, so to explain what that all means, the the beginning is the Apama namespace. So lexd-c1 underscore var snap lexd command lexd um, slash slash Ampersand, that's the namespace. And then the next one is the profile that's applied at the base of that namespace, which is another auto-generated lexd-c1 underscore var snap lexd command lexd profile. So that's the, the actual policy that lexd generated for that profile. And on top of that, so within that namespace, we do unconfined, so that's, it looks like inside the container that you're effectively unconfined even top the parent profile applies to you. We can go look at that by getting a terminal inside that particular container. There we go. And if we go look at proc self at current now, we see unconfined. Um, and we can even see that that particular container has loaded profiles. Like it's got 28 profiles that have been loaded inside the container, inside that Apartment namespace. And we can, from within the container, go poke a bit and figure out that we're actually confined. Um, so we can do NS name, which is the name of the namespace that's, that we're part of. We can see how many level of namespacing is currently applied, which is one, and can only be one, because Apano doesn't support more than one level of uh, namespacing right now. And we can check, I think there's another file, I think that's in there, uh, which, Oh, it's dot stacked, yeah, which tells us whether we've got uh, the namespacing and stacking in place, which we do. So that's what you get currently with uh, with Obama on on modern distros. No, Next, we've point. got resource limits with C groups. Yep. Yep. Hopefully, we'll, at some point, we'll have this with the, the stacking with SA Linux and App Armor. Um, yes. Um, yeah, we're definitely quite looking forward to being able, oops, sorry. No. <laughs> definitely quite looking forward to being able to run um, things like Android on, or even Red Hat and CentOS with their own confinement on top of an Apama system, or the other way around, running on a Red Hat based distro and then running confined uh, Ubuntu or SUSE or any of the other distros that use Apama. Right. So um, C groups, uh, and resource limitation feature, uh, also something that most container runtimes use. So I guess it makes sense if you don't want your container to eat all of your memory um, or hog all of your CPU. Um, it's mostly concerned with, uh, with uh, limiting various system resource resources, obviously. So you have CPU uh, block IO is the examples to find this that um, CPU set so you can um, fine tune exactly uh, how much memory a container is supposed to get by the memory C group uh, and so on. Um, we're in a state where we're dealing with two major versions of C groups, which has caused quite a bit of churn in user space. Um, so in C group V1, which is uh, the thing that most distros still use, I mean, Fedora has switched over to being C group V2 only, and at some point, I guess most distros will, will follow, but uh, most major distros right now um, still use C group V1. And in C group V1, you have the concept of a resource controller. So you mount a C group file system, but you're not, done at this step, you also need to mount uh, a given controller, whereby a controller is something like CPU set or memory. Um, and this controller is what you're actually uh, interested in. And uh, you can mount each, you can mount all controllers into the same, uh, into the same mount point. So they all show up under the same mount point. But for whatever reason, this is not how it's usually done with C group V1. What we have over time standardized on is mounting each C group controller into what is called a hierarchy, a separate C group hierarchy. So you have 
slash sys slash fs then c slash slash c group slash memory slash cpu set slash um, cpu and each of each of those uh, directories uh, under sysfs c group is its own its own controller and then uh, under each of those controllers you can have sub c groups that you move that uh, you create a C group for your container and, and so on. So it's quite a bit of work and it involves, if you want to code this, it involves a bunch of loops and moving stuff around and so on. Um, so there was some complex, complexity associated with this and there was also some issues with how different processes on different levels of the hierarchy could compete with each other for resources. So child uh, process uh, further down the hierarchy could compete with a process higher up the hierarchy for uh, for resources which um, made them less than ideal for um, for the limitation of system resources um, and cgroup 2 is, is aimed to rectify all of these problems it it has caused a bit of churn I mentioned this before because the API is so the user space experience, I should say is so different than from what you're used to with C group we won and also you now have init systems like systemd that are not just an init system but also a c group manager essentially for good reasons obviously um, uh, that have specific expectations so all the versions of systemd will not know about c group v2 or deal with c group v2 and newer versions of systemd will know about c group v2 so if you're on a on a system that only uh, boots uh, like Fedora that only has a C group V2, uh, um, C group V2 mount point, but you now run a distro that runs a, a binary, an init binary that only knows about C group V1. You have a bit of a, uh, you have a bit of a, a problem right here. But there are different strategies, different strategies uh, to solve this problem. Um, yeah, I don't need to go into details on this. this is a pseudo file system. Um, uh, but it's quite important for for containers for resource limit uh, resource limitations. We are now we have been supporting C group B two only uh, systems for quite a while, um, and most other container runtimes should have caught up by now um, as well. Yep. Okay. Uh, let's just show how C group behave. Um, this again, and we don't know what's going on. So I'm on uh, Ubuntu 20.04, which is on a hybrid setup. So if we look at uh, POC C groups, we can see I still have all of the um, C group V1 controllers listed there. And if I look at POC self C group, we'll see those same controllers again, um, with the last one zero being a unified hierarchy for C group V2. Now, if we look at C of C group, as Christian mentioned, they're all mounted separately, uh, with unified being C group V2. Yeah. Okay, so let's play with them a bit. Unshare new user namespace and just remap root. There we go. Now I want to get the process ID of this terminal. And I'm gonna switch to another terminal here. I'm going to become real root in that one. First time I do this in this demo, everything else was inside the user namespace. And I'm going to create a new subdirectory inside the bids controller. So that's a CQB1 hierarchy. I'm calling that demo. Then we're going to write the process ID of that other terminal into the cgroup.prox file in there. Now, if I switch back to my first terminal and I look at proc cgroup, we can see that the, uh, where is it? Where's bid? Yeah, bid is listed as slash demo now. It's been moved. And now we're going to apply some limits. So let's write one in the bid controller, maximum number of processes. And try doing anything. <laughs> yeah, that's not working so well, huh? Because we can't fork anymore because we've got a limit of one process and we already have one process in there. So I'm just going to fail it. Now we can go and move that limit back to, say, 5, which should make it quite a bit happier eventually once Bash retries. There we go. And now we're good. So that's basics of how to set up C groups. Obviously, that's what your container manager normally does. 
um, we still have that container C1 I created earlier. And now let's apply some limits to it real quick. So um, actually, let's just go see what that looks like before it. So if I go in there, I've got 16 gigs of RAM. And if I look for the processors, I've got four CPUs visible in there. Now let's just change that to two CPUs and we'll do one gig of RAM. Exact back in there, look at processors. That didn't work, sweet. Uh, and memory is down to one gig. Um, the processor bit is another funny aspect of uh, the CPU ZC group that I was hoping not to have to cover, but frankly I do. Um, which is that if we remove processes, um, if we remove CPUs, uh, you need the entire tree to also remove things properly. Um, it doesn't let you yank out a CPU from the entire tree. So if anything in that container treated a sub-C group, then you can't remove it, which is what happened here. Uh, if we restart the container, then the limit should be correct. Right, there we go. Uh, we've got yeah. some work planned on LibLXC itself to try and, and mitigate those kind of issues by automatically trying to figure out the right thing to do for the entire tree within a container, but it gets pretty hairy pretty quick. And that just that's a bit of a thing to keep in mind with CPU set. It's a bit weird for removing and reconfiguring. Yep. You uh, you, you have a nested container in there, right? I don't have a nested container, but I've got systemd running in there, which ah, probably okay, created okay. a Absolutely. slice of yeah. some kind, which then pins the CPU yeah, set. Yeah. Yeah. So that's something that, that can happen uh, and something worth keeping in mind. You can't always reconfigure your C groups. OK. OK. So uh, yeah, we, we got some, some something weird on the audio bridge, but I've, I think we'll just keep going and hopefully things will be OK. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah. last but not least, this is, this is a slide I once made. And uh, um, we don't need to go into, uh, into a lot of details, but this is one way of how we usually how we usually start a container, what is involved in, in uh, writing a container runtime. You can do this in different ways. You can implement this as a state machine or what have you. But um, looking at this from a more procedural pers uh, perspective, uh, we uh, what you usually do is you have a, a bunch of barriers that you place to synchronize. So you basically you start, you have your container manager um, uh, or supervising, supervising process, uh, which you start and then it forks off a child and this child process will eventually become the container once it execs. But in the meantime, before it can actually exec, there is a lot of work involved to actually um, set up the container and a lot of coordination involved between uh, the parent process and the child process to make sure that all of the things get uh, set up uh, correctly. So for example, um, be because often we need to interact with a container um, by attaching to its namespaces and so on, what the container manager process is often doing, it preserves a bunch of namespace file descriptors to be able to quickly set an S into the container's namespaces. Um, it also sets up C groups usually and sets up networking. Although I've worked on a kernel patch not a long while ago that is now uh, upstream that lets you directly spawn a container into a given C group by providing a given file descriptor to the uh, new clone 3 syscall. And then instead of having to create the C group and moving the C group, uh, moving into the C group manually, you can just create the container right in that, uh, in that C group, which is performance wise a pretty uh, big improvement because of how the locking is done inside, uh, inside of the kernel. Um, and then uh, you spawn. You obviously you specify the namespaces uh, when you create the when you create the child process that becomes the container that you want the container to be started with. But as we said before, there are some namespaces that require you uh, that require to be unshared instead of cloned because of ordering issues, uh, or simply because, for example, with the time namespace is a good is also a good example right now. Um, clone hasn't been extended uh, such that you can actually write uh, an offset um, at process creation time. This is something which uh, which we need 
to do in the future. So right now you need to unshare, need to write a bunch of offsets for your time namespace and then set an S into it. Also, uh, the container manager needs to write ID mappings after it has created the user namespace so that the, uh, that the, co the container manager needs to write ID mappings for the container so that the container can set your ID to user NS root inside of its user namespace and become privileged over its namespace. And then it can go on to set up mounts, write its LSM profile, because that needs the container manager at uh, the container needs to do it uh, itself. It needs to set up seccomp uh, and config, configure networking devices and if indeed says and so on for network devices. Uh, back. So there's actually, it's a multi-stage process that is tricky to get right. I mean, it's not impossible. None of this is obviously magic, but it's still something that requires a lot of care to not introduce any security issues. And finally, when this is all done, um, you call exec and then the init process that you chose to actually be your container starts up. And at that point, uh, um, you're done with this. But it's a it's a lot of code. I have looked at mo well, I have looked at most container runtimes and any serious container runtimes that um, uh, that want to be as generic and secure as possible have to do quite a lot of work to get this right, especially when you consider unprivileged containers coming uh, coming into the mix. But yeah, Stefan. Okay, uh, I guess I can do this one. So um, to recap, uh, just before we take a, a few questions with the, the couple of minutes we might have left at that point. Um, so containers are a user-space fiction. Uh, there is no concept of containers in the Linux kernel. It's all done in user space by combining all of the different technologies we showed you so far. Um, the like at what point you can call what you did a container is kind of up to you, which is also a bit of a problem when evaluating different technologies. You can have to, under to understand the different bits that they're using and how they're using them to know whether um, the security guarantees they might they, they might be um, advertising are correct or not. Um, like just saying we are okay to run untrusted workloads on our infrastructure so long as they are in containers is definitely a problem. Um, because that can go from anything from like the most bare privileged container that would be a massive security issue all the way to a fully set up username space plus all the restrictions on top, which would actually be pretty safe. So yeah, something to keep in mind there. Um, building safe container runtimes is very hard. You, there are a lot of moving pieces, a lot of weird kernel cases, a lot of differences based on kernel versions. Like in our case, we support all the way back down to 2.6.32, and that's not always super fun because there have been a lot of changes since. And, and some things that will work fine on older kernels don't, doesn't on the, on newer ones and vice versa. So it's a bit of an issue to keep in mind that too. Um, architectures matter, especially if you care about seccomp. So if you're going to do second policies, you need to really think, well, you need, you shouldn't be doing it directly. You should use one of the libraries. And even then you need to keep in mind that multiple personalities are a thing on Linux and that blocking a syscall on a particular personality doesn't necessarily block it on the others. And that there might be some ways to go around your profile that way. Security um, matters like there are Containers share the kernel, so obviously privileged containers are a very bad idea because they can run as real root and just jeopardize the entire security of the platform. Uh, you also want to make sure you don't pass um, unsafe devices. Like you know, you don't want to pass dev SDA to a container because even if it can't mount it, it's still able to write to it, which would then let it do very nasty things to your entire system and potentially you know escape and gain privileges or gets data that it's not supposed to access. Like you, you need to be careful of anything you expose to containers and see whether that's fine or not, given your security model. Resource management is also important. Denial of service attacks are a thing. Um, they're not necessarily as disruptive as you know stealing data or breaking your system, but they're still quite problematic. So you want to make sure you properly configure all the C-group limits uh, so that you can't easily run the system out of resources with something like a fork bomb, for example. 
And lastly, like don't reinvent the wheel. I think we mentioned it a few times, but there are a bunch of libraries around that for uh, secret management, SecComp, SLNX, Apano. They all have libraries. They all have examples. They all have existing solid policies you should build on. Um, and if possible, just you know, don't write your own runtime. Use one of the existing ones. Or you can even use LibLXC, which is what we wrote, uh, that lets you, you know, kind of choose what piece, what pieces you want to use, and what configuration you want to do to do all of that. But go doing it through a library means that a lot of the mistakes we learned in the past, you won't have to learn for yourself the hard way. Okay. Um, so looks like we've got about five minutes left and we've got a few questions. So I'm gonna, I did prioritize them on, on our side. So I'll, I'll go with some of those. Um, Christian, you can always jump in in there. Um, so, oh, and people are adding more questions, but uh, hmm, let me try to, oh, someone We're just messed with the priorities. Please don't do that. <laughs> I didn't. I, I did prioritize them before. Okay, well, someone is playing with them right now. Uh, Whoever that is, please don't click on stuff. Um, OK, so because that one I wanted to skip, uh, that one I wanted to skip. Yeah, someone really messed up the priorities that I probably applied. Um, OK. That was probably uh, me. Don't... Uh, sorry. OK, I'm just going through them again. Sorry, that's going to take a tiny bit of time. Uh, Okay, so there was a question about the difference between uh, C group resource restrictions and C group namespaces. So, I mean, they're, just, they're effectively just, so C group namespaces is effectively a feature on top of C groups. You would normally create a C group in all the resource controllers for your container. Then you would apply restrictions that you want to apply for the entire container. And then you want to create a C group namespace. That C group namespace will mean that inside the container, when they look at Proxel C group, everything will show up as slash. So as if they're at the root of a C group tree. And they can then create sub entries in their C group tree that can be more restrictive than what was applied to the container itself. So that's that's kind of the whole idea is that like you can you can then run system D slices, you can run sub containers. Uh, all of those will just work and will be able to create their own sub C groups that will be more restricted than their parent. It's self, um, it's, it, it is, it's self C group namespaces by itself are not an, uh, a resource restriction feature, but, uh, uh, sort of, uh, information, uh, information protection feature, you could probably say. Right. I mean, it does, it does plug a tiny bit of information leak in that you don't, you can't see right. uh, where you are on the host uh, C group tree anymore. But more importantly, it lets you uh, easily create sub entries without having to think about, oh, hold on. I'm in, I mean, that very long path, like, you know, slash container slash name slash something. Uh, but the view I've got in CSFS C group is actually just a subset of that. So now I need to figure out what one match what's the match between my process C group and the view I've got in CSFS C group. That was very confusing for a while. Uh, and that's what C group, F, uh, the, um, the C group namespace uh, just fixes by lining up everything inside the container so that it's, it just makes sense and it matches what you would expect on the host. There was another question around uh, Docker using all of those kernel features um, and saying that uh, Docker was based off uh, LXC before. So that's true. Docker at the beginning was indeed based on LXC and it was effectively a wrapper around, around LXC. That's not been true for years now. Uh, they've re-implemented things um, into libcontainer, which uh, then turned into container D, which then runs run C. So the entire aspect of Docker has changed. Um, most Docker deployments are using privileged containers. Don't be fooled uh, into thinking that not passing dash dash privilege to Docker means that you're running unprivileged. You're not. You're just not quite as privileged as if you pass dash dash privileged. Um, unless you manually tell Docker to do so, Docker does not use the user namespace out of the box, which means that you are in a potentially tricky situation. Um, Docker containers, because they are single process, can, however, benefit from like much tighter um, capabilities, restrictions, and um, Abana and LSM restrictions, effectively. 
And also you can run those processes as an unprivileged user inside the privileged container, which can also alleviate a number of issues. Um, but unless you've manually configured your Docker to use unprivileged containers, you're not using unprivileged containers and you should, you should be quite careful with that. Um, let me check. The, the Ray, the principle of last security. No, I, I misspoke. This is this is why I uh, made fun of myself before. It's principle uh, principle of least uh, privilege, not principle of least security. I mean, you can also have a principle of least <laughs> security. It's just not. I, I don't know how long you're going to be employed, but. Um, uh, there's a, C, a question around C groups uh, with and Stefan real should time, be worried. Um, <laughs> real time runtime limits um, overruled by an environment or uh, Yeah, I don't know about the exact um, interaction between with uh, the RT flag and using the using uh, presumably the CPU C group in that case. I'm not sure if you know anything about that, Christian. The um, RT runtime user space. Uh, question number 11. Five, six, seven, ten. I'm only seeing. Ten. Ah, OK, there's a second page. Um, run RT limits are overruled by any BAM metal when a non RT process needs to do some CPU intensive task. Real time runtime limits. Are... Yeah, I'm, I'm not I, super. Uh, I would need. I would need to know more about, details. Yeah. yeah, we've not looked into that part particularly closely. Like, so we we can probably just vaguely cover what's possible around C groups uh, for CPU. Uh, so, if well, usually my my time... kind of recommendation for people that. Real time and C groups are not really a thing, right? So they don't really get along as far as I know. Uh, so there was a session scheduled last year at uh, Linux Plumbers where um, how to make C groups in real time play along nicely. But I, 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 I don't think this is something that works as of now. Yeah, it's a bit tricky. You can do some specific, like, my best guess for that would be do specific pinning on the other that's a very specific CPU set to be used for real time tasks and you can maybe get things going that way, but otherwise it's pretty tricky. Anyway, we're out of time. Uh, we will be on the Slack channel for a little bit if people have more questions they want to, to ask there. Um, otherwise, uh, thank you everyone for listening. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, I hope you, you enjoyed it and we'll see you all at some other later conference uh, event, maybe in person at some point. All right. Thank you.